Well, hello KubeCon and hello Chicago. Uh, well, if you are here for the Minikube talk, this is the right room and also this is the talk after the lunch. So if you're here to also take a nap, this is also the right room. No judgment. All right, let's get started. Uh, before that, let me introduce myself. Who am I? My name is Media Ghazi Zadeh. I'm a senior software engineer at Google slash manager and I'm part of the Kubernetes kernel team. Also, I've been maintaining Minikube since 2019, so about four years, and I've re released 90 versions of Minikube uh, out of the 140 versions of Minikube. By a show of hands, I would like to know who here has used Minikube. I think that's almost 90% of the people. Uh, we, are, we have surveys in Minikube that we ask people why they use Minikube, and according to our surveys, 42% uh, of the users use Minikube to develop applications on, on Kubernetes, on a Kubernetes cluster. And the rest use it for learning, and uh, followed by testing is the last, last category that people use Minikube for. Minikube, when I talk to people in KubeCon, I say I maintain Minikube, they recognize Minikube with the emojis. And behind these emojis stand uh, 800 individual contributors, but um, notably two other maintainers, Stephen Powell and also Anders Buchland. They've been uh, with us for years, and uh, this is the result of their hard work as well. Uh, in this talk, I wanna, as, as I've been um, the maintainer the past four years, I would like to give you like, an overview of Minikube through the years. In each year, what happened, and uh, in the end of the presentation, I'll also talk about some interesting news you have for 2023. So Minikube started in 2016 with a GitHub issue. That was the year, at, a year before that, Google open sourced Kubernetes and everybody was so hyped about Kubernetes, and, but it was so hard to actually have a Kubernetes cluster. This was the age before Kube ADM, before, it was the age before local Kube. You had to do everything the hard way to start a Kubernetes cluster. So the, the GitHub issue was like, can we make this easy? So Dan Lauren picked up that, a GitHub issue. It says, I have some physical Windows and Mac machines. I will try to set something up. So the idea is if you have a Windows or, or a Mac OS, you're just a general laptop, you should be able to start Kubernetes cluster. And actually, uh, these are the pictures of those uh, computers under the Dan Lawrence desk that we kept in San Francisco office till COVID hit. And uh, because they required our manual intervention and manual updating, they unfortunately, they passed out due to COVID. Uh, <laughs> they are one of the few victims of uh, COVID in the computer world. Uh, but uh, rest assured, we replaced these uh, physical machines with uh, cloud-based uh, testing that we're gonna see uh, in the future slides. Fast forward, 2023, uh, Minikube has about uh, 60,000 line of code uh, of the native code and also 1.8 million line of code, including the vendors. Uh, when I started uh, working on Minikube, I uh, developed a set of principles that I have been following to, to lead this project. And I learned these principles from other projects or from the people before me. Uh, well, some of them are very familiar. You might have heard from the uh, Unix uh, principles, XP and Yagni. Yagni is short for you're not gonna need it, and XP extreme programming basically following that as, as like a true uh, principle of Minikube. So another principle has been backward compatible. So if users rely on something, as, as you, you expected in Linux world or Unix world, that you don't wanna change that because to you that might sound like a bug, but, but that bug became a feature to others. So we, that was another principle for Minikube that, uh, and also empathy and inclusion to the, to the core really. And my other principle that I've been following was data-driven decisions. Everywhere in Minikube, you're gonna see in this talk, we've used metrics and benchmarking to make every single decision. One of the inspiring talks in 2019 that really inspired me when I started working on Minikube uh, was this KubeCon talk uh, uh, called Bringing Kubernetes to the Next Billion Users. In this talk, uh, Thomas talked about uh, the next billion of humans who are gonna have internet. They don't speak English, and they do not uh, have fast internet connections. And that inspired us to make something 
for Minikube. First of all, we start adding other languages for Minikube. So nowadays, Minikube could speak multiple languages, French, Spanish, uh, two Polish and German, Chinese. Uh, but also, we make Minikube work with slow internets. That's one thing that we just first started working on it in, in, in uh, 2019. By the way, if you speak a language that is, Minikube is not supported by, you could easily contribute that language to Minikube without any knowledge of coding. You can just go to our website, click on translate, search for translations, and contribute your language to Minikube. Uh, another inclusiveness for Minikube is not just about the language or the cultural inclusiveness, but the technical inclusiveness. So Minikube is one of those tools that supports you wherever you are. If you are a Docker user, you want to start a Kubernetes cluster with Docker, let's do that. If you are a VirtualBox user, if you're a KVM user, whatever technology you have, we will start a Kubernetes cluster for you. We don't have an opinionated uh, way of saying, oh yeah, let's, let's pin ourselves down to this or that technology. And in the hypervisor world, we have all these hypervisors that we work with. The green ones are the ones that we have integration tests with. So you can have it with Podman, we can have it with VMware, uh, VirtualBox, Hyper-V. You also have SSH and bare metal. These are the two that I, I suspect most people have not heard about it that much because based on the GitHub issues that we receive, but this also exists. You can, you can install Minikube on a remote host using SSH driver. Also, Minikube is one of the few, I mean, it's the only way to try all of the container runtimes supported by CRI interface. So the Kubernetes has this idea that anybody should be able to implement a container runtime for Kubernetes, but how can we try it? Today, if you want to try Cryo, Containerd, or Docker, you could use Minikube. And at the end of this talk, we're going to talk about the NVIDIA Docker, which is a new add-on to the container runtimes of Minikube. Of course, you could uh, try all of the CNIs. That's uh, just basically Minikube start dash dash CNI, and you decide which CNI you want to use. At the top of that, the, uh, the ar ar architecture, ARM64, x86, and so on. One of the things I'd like to share with you guys uh, is Minikube is not one project. Minikube, from the beginning, has been multiple projects. I'll tell you some examples. I'm not going to go in detail of all of them. Since Minikube started, we created our own Linux, uh, kernel module by kernel module, just enough Linux for Kubernetes. And that's the Minikube's ISO. And quite frankly, that one could be its own separate project, and we are hoping to make that a separate project so we just have everybody uh, use this uh, ISO as something that we've maintained for more than seven years, like just enough Linux for Kubernetes. Another one is the machine driver, which we recently moved it out to Minikube machine organization on GitHub, which means this is the type of, this is the code that knows how to create a machine. Does not matter what machine you want to create. You want to create Hyper-V, you want to create KVM, Docker, whatever type of machine you want to create, the Minikube machine knows how to create that. If the name sounds familiar, because it is, the Minikube machine initially was Docker machine. That Docker machine, they stopped developing that in uh, somewhere in 2018. Officially, it has been read only since 2019. But Minikube has, has kept that project alive. Now it's called Minikube Machine. It's a, basically a fork of that with all the good things up to date. Uh, other things that I'm not going to go through, Minikube has Minikube GUI, which is like a graphical interface. It's a separate project. Minikube website is our own thing. Set up Minikube, uh, which is like a GitHub action that you can use Minikube with. And Minikube, Minikube was the project that, unfortunately, we could not use Prow, so we have been maintaining our own infrastructure for testing. And the reason for that is Minikube could not run, uh, Minikube needed testing with virtual machines and nested virtualization because we wanted to test all of these different hypervisors that we support. So we have our own set of infrastructure that we, we manage as well. Other than the upstream, I mean, the other than projects around Minikube, Minikube also has uh, dependencies that we rely on. For example, upstream Kubernetes. Whenever Kubernetes does something, it affects us. It has happened before. The kubelet does something that breaks this or that. Uh, and basically, if any of these projects do something that breaks, it also breaks Minikube. Uh, so I am not going to go through all of them. Kube ADM, CryDockerD, uh, Mobi, Beldroot, uh, and so on. 
uh, you guys remember that this is our test machine, test machine from um, Dan Lawrence desk uh, that we transformed it to a, a multi-cloud uh, testing. So we have testing in GCP, AWS, Equinox, uh, uh, Azure, and Mac Stadium, and so far and so on. So we have uh, testing everywhere, a combination of hypervisors and a combination of uh, drivers and container runtimes. And during my time at, uh, working on open source projects, I never seen any project with this level of combination of tests in, in different environment. So back in 2019, the state of the Minikube, both in CPU usage and the start time, was really, really awful. Uh, to the extent that I remember when my manager was talking, like, my laptop is running hot, we would have to ask her, are you running Minikube? And it was not a joke. It was really, a lot of the time, it was a problem. Uh, and we have this joke now in the Minikube meetings, burning the legs of, of developers since 2016. But we had to do something about it in 2016. So we started benchmarking. We developed tools that we open sourced. That we, we created the flame graph for every function in Minikube that is being invoked. We measure every CPU usage of every function. And it, actually, that's a topic of a, another a, a KubeCon talk in 2020. If you like, you could uh, watch it. In Minikube website, we have a section for all of our talks. You could refer to that if you want to know in depth about that. This is a before after. You could see how Minikube CPU usage went down. On the left, uh, you could see the Minikube CPU usage over time. And on the right side, the chart, I'm sorry, that's very small to see, but you could see it larger on our website under the benchmarking section. You could see the Minikube compared to other uh, tools in the industry, like K3D or Kind or Docker Desktop, uses the least amount of CPU uh, based on these open source tools that we developed to measure the CPU usage as well. Same as a Minikube start. It used to take almost three minutes to start a Kubernetes cluster. So in 2020, we made it 21. And nowadays, you could even get away with 17 seconds if you have a, if a good uh, internet connection and a good, uh, uh, good enough laptop. And a part of that was also VM free uh, and uh, preload images, which is its own project as well. We basically invented a, a, a new mechanism to preload images for VM drivers and Docker drivers and Podman. Uh, another tool that we developed called Time to Kates. This is, uh, goes back to the principle of Minikube being data driven. Time to Kates can measure you from zero to when your Kubernetes cluster is ready. So, and we can measure that uh, when the API server is running, when the etcd is running, when the, app, the cluster is ready to start running your app. So both of these tools, Slowjam and Kate, Time to Case, is also open source, and we use that to, to make Minikube uh, better. We also have set up automatic benchmarking using these tools in our website. So every day we have daily benchmarking using all of these benchmarking tools we have in different categories so we can have better idea if we are making Minikube worse or better for the users over the time. Year 2021 was the year of embedded use. This is what the year that uh, Minikube was used by Scaffold, CloudCode, other uh, tools, and they wanted features uh, that uh, was good for embedded use. So, for example, auditing, uh, watch flags, schedule stop, JSON output, and so on. Uh, 2021 also the, was the year of uh, Minikube CI. We started based on the uh, request we got. We made Minikube work in all of the CIs that we could find, Prow, CloudBuild, um, Travis, and so on. And also Minikube GitHub Action. Uh, we have an official GitHub Action for Minikube. If you are curious how to use it, it's super easy. You can just add that step to your GitHub Action. Uh, we also, Minikube did not have a website when I started. It was basically uh, marked on files in our GitHub repo, and we overhauled that documentation to a website, and we, uh, we have sections for everything. Tutorials, handbooks, add-ons, frequently asked questions, uh, contribution guides, and so on. 
We also created Twitter bots and Slack channels that to communicate with the, with the users better. Also, on Wednesday, we started this uh, new thing called Triage Party that we invite the community to come triage the GitHub issues for, with us because Minikube being the front end uh, project that users go to to start a Kubernetes cluster, we, we get a lot of the newcomers uh, GitHub issues. And uh, triaging Minikube would be um, beneficial if we use the community you know, in that because we get a lot of GitHub issues from the absolute beginner users. Uh, and by the way, this tool, Triage Party, uh, came out of Minikube, and now multiple SIGs and repos in GitHub, SI in, in Kubernetes world are using that. Um, the link to all of that is going to be in the end of the slides. Another thing we did was investing in the developer velocity. The, this tool we built called GoPoke, which converts the Golang integration test to a parsable, foldable, searchable uh, 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 way. So the left is just the raw test logs. Unfortunately, Minikube has to gather a lot of logs from because we have embedded systems, we have embedded Linux, we have hypervisors, we have to gather a lot of logs. So every failed test would, could have up to 10,000 lines of uh, logs. So if you have 300 test cases, that's a lot. So we, we, uh, Gobo can uh, make the test logs sortable for you individually. You can link to them. And you can, uh, and on the top of that, Gopo can help us to identify the flake tests. Um, so this is an example of comment on the uh, a Minikube PR that tells the, the, the maintainer, helps the maintainer to know which test is not a flaky test and is failing on this PR. So this test is flaking 0% of the time. So it's highly likely that this uh, PR broke this test. This is also a, another chart. As I said, one of the principles of Minikube was like gather as much data as we can. This shows uh, different test cases in Minikube, how much they are flaking over time. You can see some tests are flaking more or less over time. And that helped us uh, increase our developer velocity. We, the year 2021, we also created automations for everything, basically everything we could do uh, to, to uh, delegate that to a machine, we did that. So today, Minikube uh, bot has created more than 500 PRs. There was, there was tasks that we had to do it manually, and some of them were very, very long tasks, such as building an ISO or an image that would take three, four hours. And we made the automation to build those images when we are sleeping at midnight, and the test will be run on them. And then we come to office in the 8, 8 a.m. in the morning, the tests are ready for us, we're just ready to merge it if we want to. Um, year 2022 was an interesting year. This was the year that uh, Docker Desktop announced that they are going to charge on Mac OS and Windows. And I saw a lot of users uh, organically making blog posts that they're using Minikube as a Docker Desktop replacement. Because basically, Minikube is a, has a VM and has the free Mobi Docker, the open source Docker in a Linux, which is free and legal to use. So they would just say, let's just use Minikube instead of Docker Desktop. And they, they were asking us, can you? Give us a Minikube without Kubernetes. I don't care about Kubernetes. I just want to use it. And ironically, we delivered that feature. So you can actually today <laughs> run Minikube without Kubernetes. Uh, this is KubeCon, but uh, this is, uh, it was one of the interesting things happened in 2022. Uh, 2022 was also the year of ARM64 with the M1 laptops uh, from Mac. Uh, Apple uh, became popular. So it's like, it was a year of delivering the key MU driver also ARM64 for Docker, uh, and so on. Year 2023, this was the Minikube GUI. Uh, I'm curious, who here has used or heard of the Minikube GUI? Oh, two people, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that actually people know about it. Not that many people know about it, and this project's actually ready to use. You could use that today, and um, if you like. Uh, year 2023 uh, was also the year of AI. So today, uh, actually, we released Minikube just before this talk, and you can use Minikube with NVIDIA uh, GPUs today on Docker driver on Linux. So if you have a uh, GPU on your machine and you want to 
try AI stuff on it, you could start Minikube with Minikube start dash dash GPUs NVIDIA. We have a doc on how to use that. Uh, we are also working on creating code labs for it. Uh, and I hope that this, um, this uh, helped the users to, um, to, to get their hands on AI easier. Because in the 2016, when Kubernetes was uh, brand new and fresh, a lot of people wanted to get their hands on the Kubernetes, and Minikube helped them to onboard them to Kubernetes and help with the adoption of Kubernetes. And the, to this year, we, a lot of people talk about AI, but not that many people actually have, have their hands dirty with the AI. So uh, maybe this will be a feature that would be helping them again in 2023. Also, we have another uh, add-on called Kubeflow add-on. You could enable it today. Uh, it's called Minikube add-ons enable Kubeflow, uh, which you could basically run um, any uh, AI workflow, Jupyter networks, and anything uh, you want to try. Again, we are, we are working on code labs to have like a walkthrough of uh, trying all of these new AI features, so stay tuned for that. But our documentation, our website, if you just go to the Minikube website and search for NVIDIA, we have enough to get you started. Well, uh, now it is, uh, there's a link to all of the uh, Minikube GitHub repos that I, I uh, talked about here. You can see the Minikube GUI, uh, the machine driver, uh, set up Minikube GitHub action, slow jam, triage party, uh, go poke, which was the one that converts the integration test results to a more parsable one. Um, time to Kates, which was the one that helps you to measure performance of a local Kubernetes from the start to the time that it gives you uh, a Kubernetes cluster. We also have a bunch of other things, such as pull sheets, that uh, helps you to generate um, leaderboards on your uh, GitHub issue. So one thing that uh, we noticed, um, peop a lot of people will help us in triaging GitHub issues, but they would not get recognized in, in the release notes. So we like, let's change that. So we built a tool, actually, to measure uh, contributions other than coding. So we could uh, quantify that and measure that and, and, uh, and give recognition to the people who, who worked on it. Um, that was the end of my talk, so thank you very much. That if you uh, have any questions, I'm here to answer them. And then if you like, you could also leave your feedback for this session. So thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yeah. I am very lucky for the past uh, few years that Google has been paying me to do this and the things that I really like. Uh, of course, there are a lot of things that you do other than that, but this is, has been my main uh, focus of that, and I'm grateful for, for Google sponsoring this. Yeah, um, we are lucky that we have maintainers who are non-Googlers as well. I, in the beginning of the slide, actually, I uh, let's go to the first slide. Da, Anders Bjorklund, he, he's uh, the other uh, maintainer. Uh, he has been around also for four years. Um, I should have gone. The, oh, where is it? Here, yeah. Stephen Powell and Anders Bjorklund. Um, they're the other maintainers. Um, um, to answer your questions better, um, there's uh, flows of incoming contributors, and it goes up and down, just like a sinus you know, wave. I have seen days that be 15 people coming to the office hour, and it's like, give me a task, give me a task. And uh, there have been days I've been only one person who was like non-Googler. So it's like... Um, that it comes in waves, and I, I, I think Minikube has been lucky or uh, 
fortunate that more uh, contributors came to Minikube than Kubernetes. Because I think Kubernetes is kind of like a scaly looking big thing and a lot of new contributors would not want to go touch Kubernetes itself directly, so they feel more welcome to start with Minikube first. So we see a lot of people who start their first uh, uh, contribution to the Kubernetes world through Minikube. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, what, what are you asking? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, onboarding for contributors? Yeah, I, I'm glad you asked, actually. So in our website, if you go to the Minikube website, let me, we have a, a section called Contributing Guide. So let's see, go to Minikube. Um, so here, if you go to here, at the very end, there's a contributing section. They basically have a step-by-step -step how to contribute in different sections of uh, Minikube. You. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Um, so this is a very good question, and uh, I, I think uh, there are many ways you can compare them, from performance-wise, from usage-wise. So Minikube has some special features that some, has some loyal customers that they cannot live without Minikube. And one of them is uh, fast image build. Uh, so I, I didn't talk about the image build uh, benchmarking. I'm gonna show you guys here in our website this is how fast you can build an image if you're a developer. Uh, this is uh, versus Minikube, versus Kind, and versus K3D, and versus MicroCase. So the orange is MicroCase, the, gr the green is K3D, um, the lighter yellow, I mean, this one is Kind, and this red and blue are the Minikube. So th this is about 36 times faster to build an image using Minikube's Docker end feature. And interestingly, we have the Minikube's Docker N feature for container D as well. So we can call it container D N at this point, but for the legacy and don't break me uh, purposes, we kept it called. Uh, so so they, we have like, some loyal customers that they cannot live without it. So another loyal customers are the embedded users. So they use Minikube as embedded. So Minikube has JSON output for all of the commands has auditing, so you have multiple embedded tool, let's say scaffold and cloud code and tilt, whatever, they all use Minikube at the same time. We have auditing features that so who did what on the cluster, uh, they could use those features. And we have, uh, in the, the, the slide that I went through, I was scared that I'm gonna run out of time, but I skipped on it very quickly, so there was a slide on um, embedded use, yeah. This is some of the features that the embedded users use. Um, so Minikube is more uh, tuned towards the people who want to develop applications on a, a Kubernetes cluster, and they want to do fast and easy. Um, other tools have their own special things. Uh, K3D, uh, we have learned a lot from them. They have done an amazing job. Uh, they have a very small image. They have a um, very low uh, CPU footprint, uh, but they don't have the features that uh, some traditional Minikube users would want. So I think every, uh, they, uh, everything is, can be compared for, for based on who you are, what kind of use case you have. Yeah. Good question. Are you going to create a Keda plugin? Uh, am I going to create a what? The Keda add-on. I found one on GitHub that installed easily, but I, it's not in the add-ons. Oh, you, you actually, uh, I'm glad you asked. So you, you can create an add-on for Minikube very easily, and we have the step-by-step -step documentation how to create an add-on in Minikube. Just go to Minikube uh, website, search for add-on. Uh, here. No, no, not this one. Come on, demo gods, don't disappoint me. <laughs> um, how to develop a Minikube add-on. Actually, this was the first link. I didn't look at the first one, this one. So this is a detailed how you can create an add-on. A lot of people are developing add-ons and contribute to Minikube and we accept them. Uh, yeah, as long as they are open source, they're not like anything proprietary that we cannot include. Yeah, why not? I didn't see your slides posted. 
Oh, I posted it right before the thing. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, it, it has to be there, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you're welcome. Any other question? Uh, uh, the Minikube website, I hope everybody knows how to get there. Just minikube.sigs.kates.doc. Uh, if you want to try the NVIDIA thing, just search for NVIDIA here using NVIDIA with GPUs at Minikube and tells you based on what driver and what technology you want to use it to tell you how to use that. Um, if you want to use the Minikube GUI, uh, I, I think it's a very cute project. I really like this uh, Minikube GUI. Uh, so try it out, this Minikube GUI thing. It's kind of cool. Uh, well, we have one minute left. Any last question? Thank you very much, and have a great day.